Solve problems on the squeeze theorem. We start by reviewing the theory. The squeeze theorem states that if um, xn is uh, always at most yn is always at most zn, and if the sequences formed by the numbers xn and the numbers zn have the same limit L, then the sequence formed by the numbers yn has also that limit. Graphically, this uh, can be easily understood. The z end, the numbers z end are indicated here by the blue dots, the numbers x n by the red dots, the numbers y n are always between x n and z n. Now the horizontal axis is the n axis. As n grows, if the numbers x n and the numbers z n approach the same number l, then the numbers y n has no choice but to approach that number as well. Therefore, the sequence y n also converges and has l as its limit. In these problems, we use the floor function. The floor of x is defined to be the largest integer which is at most x. The problems are the following. We have to figure out whether the following sequences converge. The first one is sequence formed by the numbers n times floor of n squared over 3 and that product divided by floor of n cubed over 6. The second problem is uh, the sequence formed by the numbers floor of square root of n minus square root of n plus 1. We have to figure out whether it converges. In the third problem, we have to figure out whether the sequence formed by the numbers n squared plus n times sine of n and that sum divided by n squared plus cosine of n, whether that converges. Problems 4 and 5 are slightly more complicated. In problem 4, we consider the sequence formed by the numbers 1 over square root of n squared plus 1, plus 1 over square root of n squared plus 2 plus, and so forth, plus 1 over square root of n squared plus n. So the nth term of this sequence is a sum, which sum itself contains n terms, which are of this form 1 over square root of n squared plus k, k from 1 to n. The final problem has important applications. We have to figure out whether the sequence formed by the numbers 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third plus and so forth plus 1 over n converges or not. This sequence is like the sequence in problem number 4, formed by sums. The nth element of this sequence is a sum that has n terms. We have to figure out whether this sum converges. In this problem, we have to figure out whether the sequence formed by the numbers n times floor of n squared over 3 and that product divided by floor of n cubed over 6 converges or not. This is somewhat complicated because uh, the general term is a fraction that involves the floor function both in the numerator and in the denominator. We want to estimate this general term so that our upper and lower estimates do not anymore involve the floor function. To that end, we observe that floor of x, which is defined to be the largest integer at most x, satisfies the double inequality. Floor of x is larger than x minus 1, and it is at most x. This is immediately by its definition. Therefore, the quantity floor of n squared over 3 is at most n squared over 3 and at least n squared over 3 minus 1. And likewise, floor of n cubed over 6 is at most n cubed over 6 and it is strictly larger than n cubed over 6 minus 1. Now if we assume that n is at least 2, then all these quantities, n squared over 3 minus 1 and n cubed over 6 minus 1, and all the other quantities appearing in these double inequalities are positive. So now we estimate 
the general term, the quantity n times flo rho n squared over 3, and that divided by flo rho n cubed over 6, from the above and from the below, so that to get the upper estimate, we replace the numerator by its upper estimate and the denominator by its lower estimate, and to get a lower estimate for this general term, we replace the numerator by its lower estimate and denominator by its upper estimate. Since all these estimates are now positive, we get the double inequality that the general term of this sequence is always larger than n times n squared over 3 minus 1, and that divided by n cubed over 6, and always at most n times n squared over 3, and that divided by n cubed over 6 minus 1. So this is now the estimate that we obtained. And uh, we might want to simplify the right and the left-hand side of these estimates. The left-hand side, n times n squared over 3 minus 1, and that divided by n cubed over 6, can be simplified. It is 2 times n cubed minus 6 times n, and that divided by n cubed. And this can further be simplified. It is 2 times n squared minus 6, and that divided by n squared. Likewise, the right-hand side of this double inequality for the general term simplifies to 2 times n cubed over n cubed minus 6. After these simplifications, we now have the estimate that the general term n times floor of n squared over 3 and that divided by floor of n cubed over 6 is less than 2 times n cubed over n cubed minus 6 and it is larger than 2 times n squared minus 6 divided by n squared. These estimates are valid assuming that n is at least 2. So now this lower bound, 2 times n squared minus 6 divided by n squared, can be written as 2 minus 6 times n squared divided by 1. We have divided both the numerator and denominator by n squared. And now as n grows, 6 divided by n squared approaches 0, and the limit of these quantities is 2, as n goes towards the infinity. The low upper bound, 2 times n cubed divided by n cubed minus 1, can be written as 2 divided by 1 minus 6 divided by n cubed, and that approaches 2 as well as n goes towards the infinity. This means that the answer is that the sequence converges, and that the limit of this sequence is 2. Our task in this problem is to figure out whether the sequence formed by the numbers floor of square root of n minus square root of n plus 1 converges or not. We attempted to apply similar argument as in the solution of the previous problem. We attempted to estimate uh, the general term from the above and from the below and then use the squeeze theorem. It turns out that this does not work. We have to do something different. And we start by observing that whenever x is a positive number, negative 1 is less than square root of x minus square root of x plus 1, and this is less than 0. This is now a claim which uh, may seem obvious, but needs a justification. So the proof of the claim starts by observing that clearly when x is positive, x plus 1 is of course larger than x, and therefore square root of x plus 1 is also larger than square root of x, and the difference of these two quantities is therefore negative. Now consider square root of x plus 1 minus 1, and that difference squared, it is uh, x plus 1 minus 2 times square root of x plus 1 plus 1. Now if x is positive, then x plus 1 is larger than 1, square root of that is larger than 1, and 1 minus 2 times square root of x plus 1 plus 1 is negative. Therefore, x plus 1 minus 2 times square root of x plus 1 plus 1 is less than x, but x is also square root of x squared. Now, remember, x is positive number. So, 
we have observed that square root of x plus 1 minus 1 and that quantity squared is less than square root of x squared which means that square root of x plus 1 minus 1 is less than x and this means that negative 1 is less than square root of x minus square root of x plus 1 which on the other hand is less than 0 always. So we have now proved the claim and we use this result to figure out whether this sequence converges or not and if it does converge then by this result we may also compute its limit. So we have obtained that for all positive numbers x negative 1 is less than square root of x minus square root of x plus 1 is less than 0. We apply this to estimate the general term in this sequence. When n is positive Therefore, negative 1 is less than square root of n minus square root of n plus 1, and this is less than 0. And this means that the floor of this quantity, square root of n minus square root of n plus 1, is always negative 1. This is so for all values of n. So the sequence that we have to study consists of numbers negative 1 only. And this means that the sequence converges and its limit is negative 1. In problem 3, we have to figure out whether the sequence formed by the quantities n squared plus n times sin of n divided by n squared plus cosine of n converges or not. To that end, we have to estimate uh, this fraction from the above and from the below by quantities that do not involve the sine function. So sine is always between negative 1 and 1, and cosine as well. We replace sine by its theoretical lower value and cosine by its theoretical upper value in this general term to get a lower estimate. So we observe that n squared plus n times sine of n divided by n squared plus cosine of n is always larger than or maybe equal to n squared minus n divided by n squared plus 1 it is actually always strictly larger than this quantity. And likewise, the upper estimate is obtained by replacing sine in the numerator by its theoretical maximum value, which is 1, and cosine by its minimum value, which is negative 1. So we get the upper estimate n squared plus n divided by n squared minus 1. And the lower estimate, n squared minus n divided by n squared plus 1, can be also written as 1 minus 1 divided by n, and that divided by 1 plus 1 over n squared. This we have obtained by dividing by n squared. And therefore, this quantity approaches 1, because 1 over n and 1 over n squared both approach 0, as n goes to the infinity. Likewise, the upper estimate, n squared plus n divided by n squared minus 1, can be written as 1, 1 plus 1 divided by n, and that sum divided by 1 minus 1 divided by n squared. And also here, 1 over n and 1 over n squared approach 0 as n goes to the infinity, therefore the limit is 1. So we obtained for this general term lower and upper limits, which both lower and upper limits approach 1 as n goes to the infinity. By the squeeze theorem, we now conclude that this sequence converges and that its limit is 1 as n goes to the infinity. We have to study the convergence of the sequence formed by the terms 1 divided by square root of n squared plus 1 plus 1 divided by square root of n squared plus 2 plus and so forth plus 1 divided by square root of n squared plus n. This is a sequence whose general term is a sum of n different terms. We have to use the squeeze theorem to figure out whether this sequence converges. Now, the general term of the sequence is a sum of quantities of the type 1 divided by square root of n squared plus k, where k is between 1 and n, and n is now at least 1. So, if we replace k by 0, then the expression 1 divided by square root of n squared plus k becomes larger. Therefore, we conclude that this is less than 1 over n. I have written here on the slide it is less than or equal to 1 over n. It is actually strictly always less than 1 over n. 
Likewise, if we replace k by its upper bound n in this expression 1 divided by square root of n squared plus k, the whole expression becomes smaller. So we get that the lower limit is 1 divided by square root of n squared plus n. We may use these estimates and we observe that this general term 1 divided by square root of n squared plus 1 plus 1 divided by square root of n squared plus 2 plus and so forth plus 1 divided by square root of n squared plus 1 is at most n divided by n. It is n times 1 over n which is 1 and at least n times 1 over square root of n squared plus n. So this is now a useful estimate and we use the squeeze theorem together with this estimate to figure out whether this sequence has a limit or not. Now the right hand side estimate, the upper estimate is just 1. So the limit of these upper estimate quantities is also 1 because the upper estimate doesn't change. The lower estimate is n divided by square root of n squared plus n and dividing both the numerator and the denominator by n we get that this is 1 divided by square root of 1 plus 1 over n. As n goes to the infinity 1 over n goes to 0 and we conclude that the limit of this quantity is 1 divided by square root of 1 which is just 1. So we observe that this sequence converges and that its limit is 1. The sequence whose terms are sums of the form 1 plus 1 half plus and so forth plus 1 over n is especially important. In order to understand whether this sequence converges or not, we interpret these quantities appearing in this sequence as areas of certain rectangles. So we first draw the xy plane. We draw it so that the scale in the x-axis and y-axis, they are different, so this area shown here is, corresponds to x-axis interval from 0 to 10 and y-axis interval from 0 to 1. Now the first term of the sum 1 plus 1 half plus and so forth plus 1 over n is uh, the area of a rectangle or actually a square whose base is the x-axis interval from 0 to 1 and whose height is 1. This square now looks like a rectangle here because the scale, scales are different on x and y axis. So the area of this blue rectangle is the first term of the sum appearing in this sequence. It is just 1. Then we take the next rectangle, its height is 1 half. And the area of this blue and the red rectangle is now 1 plus 1 half. Then we continue. We add the third rectangle whose height is one third and the area of this blue rectangles and the, this one red rectangle is now one plus one half plus one third. And we continue in this way. We get um, rectangles whose height goes uh, down. So, so the height is given by one over n. And here we have ten rectangles and the joint area of these ten rectangles is one plus one half plus and so forth, plus 1 over 10. So now our task is to understand this quantity 1 plus 1 half plus and so forth, plus 1 over 10, and then generalize that argument to a general term of this sequence. To that end, we draw this green rectangle. Its height is the height of the lowest rectangle appearing in this sum, the lowest of the blue and red rectangles. Therefore, this green rectangle is completely contained in the joint area of the blue and red rectangles. It means that the area of this green rectangle is less than the combined area of the blue and red rectangles. So in this case, it simply means that 1 plus 1 half plus and so forth plus 1 over 10 is greater than 10 times 1 over 10, which is 1. 
Now this seems completely obvious because of course 1 plus 1 half and plus and so forth is greater than 1. But it is the argument that counts here. This 10 here in this estimate is uh, the length of the base of this green rectangle and 1 tenth is the height of this green rectangle. We estimate the quantities 1 plus 1 half plus and so forth plus 1 over 10 by dividing this sum into puzzle sums. And we estimate these puzzle sums using the same method as we used a moment ago for the 10 first sums. So we look at the quantity 1 divided by 10 to the power k minus 1 plus 1, plus 1 divided by 10 to the power k minus 1 plus 2 plus and so forth, plus 1 divided by 10 to the power k. This is a sum that has 10 to the power k minus 10 to the power k minus 1 terms. Each one of these terms is at least the smallest term, which is 1 divided by 10 to the power k. Since there are 10 to the power k minus 10 to the power k minus 1 terms, then the sum is larger than 10 to the power k minus 10 to the power k minus 1 times the smallest term, which is just 1 over 10 to the power k. So we obtain the estimate that 1 over 10 to the power k minus 1 plus 1 plus 1 over 10 to the power k minus 1 plus 2 plus and so forth plus 1 over 10 to the power k is larger than 10 to the power k minus 10 to the power k minus 1 divided by 10 to the power k. But this is just 1 minus 1 over 10, which is 9 over 10. Now this is a very useful observation because this tells us that the sum 1 plus 1 half plus and so forth plus 1 over 10 to the power k is larger than 9 times k divided by 10 for all k. In this sum, 1 plus 1 half plus and so forth plus 1 over 10 to the power k, we have grouped elements of this sum into parcel sums. Each one of these parcel sums is larger than 9 over 10, and there are k such parcel sums, therefore the whole sum is larger than 9 times k over 10. But 9 times k over 10 grows arbitrarily large as k grows. Therefore, by an application of the argument of the squeeze theorem, we conclude that this sequence does not converge to a finite number. The quantities 1 plus 1 half plus and so forth plus 1 over n, they grow arbitrarily large as n grows. This is an important observation. This series formed here is so-called harmonic series. We haven't yet quite defined what the series is. Series is an infinite sum. Summation k from 1 to the infinity, 1 over k, is the harmonic series. It is the infinite sum 1 plus 1 half plus and so forth. And this observation that we just made tells us that the harmonic series does not have a finite value. This fact has important consequences and will be also discussed later more in detail. We have discussed applications of the squeeze theorem and of its arguments. The squeeze theorem stated that uh, if the numbers yn are between xn and zn, and zn's and xn's have the same limit l, then the numbers yn have no other chance than have the same limit l as well. The, in the same principle can be used to study the situation where, let's say, xn's or zn's have as their limit positive infinity or negative infinity, then the yn's must have a limit positive infinity or negative infinity as well. And this is a uh, what we use to study the harmonic series.